Well, welcome this morning to the lakes. Great to see everybody that's here that has gathered with us. And for those that are streaming online this morning, great that you could join us as well. My name is Colin, and um, it's just great to be able to be here and to have our hearts worship the very living God this morning. Now, here at the lakes, we do bring ourselves under the New South Wales COVID um, recommendations. So we do encourage the use of face masks. This is mine. And um, we do encourage social distancing, which is good to see, hand sanitising. And also, just to keep in mind, and I'll mention it at the end of the service, that we do have to be off-site by approximately 20 past 10 to make way for the other service coming in. So just to keep that in mind, and folks here at the lakes, it's been fantastic to, we just go through God's word, and it's been great to be able to go through the book of Romans, and Romans has been such a fantastic encouragement to see God unfold his great plan of salvation to to us and across the world. And it's been great to be going through that chapter by chapter. Today, Dave is going to unpack for us chapter 11, some tricky verses, but it's going to be great this morning. So we're in for a great time. So engage our service this morning and to engage with the living God with your hearts this morning. I'm going to hand it over to Jen. It's going to lead us in some songs. Good morning, everyone. We are going to stand and worship our great God together. And if you are at home, please sing loudly for us. And for those of you who are here, let's stand and clap and worship our great God.
is a beautiful song. We have just sung that it's all because of Jesus we're alive. And so we can, at the cross, surrender our lives to him. You can just close your eyes and ponder on these words. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and great to at least be able to worship from our hearts this morning. Now, once every year, we've had a church family get together, and it's been great because we would meet together on a Saturday, have a guest speaker, 
be able to sing together, hear the preaching of God's word, and Saturday, and we do that on Sunday, we'd have lunch together, it was great. But this year, well, <clears throat> we're not able to do that. But next week, we do have a guest speaker. Greg Lees from Hunter Bible Church will be with us. And so if you're able to make it with us here, that's going to be a real blessing. But we won't be doing the lunching and we won't be doing the Saturday, we won't be doing those things. But if you're able to meet, maybe even with a growth group or some mates, maybe you could meet over a barbecue together and still sort of experience a bit of a weekend family church time together. So I want to encourage that with you to take place for next week. So be thinking about that, praying about that with Greg Lees coming next week. Now, also with COVID this year, man, I don't know about you, but it has been at times a bit bleak. I mean, you hear the news. I've stopped listening to half the news, you know. New South Wales is on a knife edge. We're going to build a wall across Victoria. And you just go, oh, man. But, you know, it hasn't all been doom and gloom. There have been some great things happen this year. Joy and I, for example, we celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. (laughs) And... I know what you're thinking as you look at that photo. You think, man, he hasn't changed a bit. And that that is just so true. (laughs) We were going to celebrate overseas, but we instead, we thought, man, a great alternative would be to spend it in sunny Canberra. So we went down there for our 40th wedding anniversary and then across to the coast. But here at the lakes, there's also been, there's been up to date so far during COVID, we've had four weddings as well. So I'm just going to take you through those that got married this year so far. We've had Mark and Carolyn Clouston. There's just something about seeing, you know, young couple, like that previous photo as well. <laughs> and then we've had uh, Damien and Jennifer, uh, Van der Mullen got married here at the lakes and then we had Sam and Andrea O'Shea Mason and Kelly Tyra and and they've moved down to Sydney and then we've got four weddings coming up here at the lakes we've got the Sam Corley and Tara Kirkland getting married in December. We've got Ben Peterson, Taylor Cox. We've got Kate Lynette and um, Huna Kitch. And we've got Melissa Kendall and Matt Green. And I trust that in 40 years' time, those couples will be able to stand here and give the same announcement. Wouldn't that be something? So that's great. Folks, we're going to pray and we'll pray for them and we'll seek to be an encouragement to them and uh, pray for our church and our state and our governments as well. Would you just bow with me as we just take a few moments to pray? Heavenly Father, we just come before you. Father, we're so thankful that you are our God, and Father, we can come freely to you because, Father, there is free access. Father, we don't have to come with guilt. We don't have to come... Father, to you, of thinking of, <clears throat> excuse me, thinking of the things that we have achieved to gain access to your presence. But Father, we can just come to you because all of what our Lord Jesus has done for us, that Father, he's died on the cross in our place. And Father, he has brought peace between you and us. And Father, by faith, we can enter into that great relationship, a personal relationship with you where we can walk with you and know you, that, Father, through difficult times and tough times, Father, you're right there with us. Your hand takes hold of us. You guide, you lead. At times, Father, it feels dark. At times, Father, we're not sure where to step. But, Father, you know where we're stepping. You lead us, you guide us. And we thank you for that. We think of these young couples, Father, this year, that um, Father got married Father, we pray, oh, Father, guide them, encourage them, 
people, Father, just step them forward. Father, we know that relationships are at times tough and difficult. We know, Father, they'll go through some difficult times. And Father, even for some of the marriages and relationships here at the lakes, maybe people listening, Father, maybe they're going through a really tough time at the moment. And we just pray that God, your spirit, Father, would show them, point them forward, help them to forgive, help them to love. Father, just as you have with us. Father, we think of the couples coming up for marriage. Likewise, Father, encourage them as they take those steps. And Father, to be a testimony to those round about them as well. Father, we think of our government. We think of our federal government, our state. Oh, Father, we get discouraged and we hear so much politicising of pandemic, politicising of events, people trying to score points. Father, we just pray, God, they would have compassion. God, they would have empathy. Father, they would be able just to, Father, step aside from point scoring and, Father, just do what is right for people and for our country and, Father, that you would guide and lead them. Father, we do pray there would be an element of peace across our country, not just our country, across the world as well. Father, you are a great God in control, and we thank you for that. And Father, for the lakes and our lakes leadership, Father, be with Dave and Ruth. Father, encourage them, draw close, keep them close to you. And Father, for the rest of our team, all our leaders, even all our volunteer leaders, Father, encourage us. Father, to be the people, to be the lighthouse to be your people in the midst of this day and age which we find ourselves. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Corinne's going to come and read God's word to us this morning. All righty. So we're going to read from Romans 11. If you would like to turn there, or you can listen. Alrighty, so Romans chapter 11. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people, whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, that he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain, but the elect did. The others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. And David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent forever. Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for Gentiles, how much more greater will their fulfilness bring? I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse in my own people to envy to save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first roots is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over these branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, 
but afraid, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you will also be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion, and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on the account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them. O oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counsellor, or who has given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Corinne. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you here. Uh, and uh, yes, so the numbers are growing uh, here within the uh, auditorium today. Um, it's, uh, I, I want to start just by acknowledging that 2020 hasn't worked out the way most people planned. Uh, so if 2020 was an avocado, this is the type of avocado it would be. You know, you look on the outside, you think, oh, it looks good. It's going to be great. You know, spread it on the toast. And you open it up and it's all pip, you know, and there's no, no good stuff. Um, this is how Reese Witherspoon captured her year, uh, like this, so optimistic and full of hope in January, and then it just starts to kind of spiral downhill. Uh, it gets worse and worse. And, uh, and the number of celebrities have followed suit uh, in putting things up. This dog uh, even posted his... His Instagram experience, you know, look at, you know, out there amongst the flowers early in the year, there's the toilet paper incident in March and then on the couch and then it's just like, kind of like a horror movie from, uh, from June onwards. Um, there's a whole bunch of comparisons um, going on between my plans and how 2020 actually mapped out. So this is the Titanic uh, version of it. My plans, you know, up there on the deck. Uh, but how it turned out, you know, the ship's going down. Oh, I created one of these, right? So my plans, you know, you can see fluffy cat, you know, optimistic, full of hope, and then uh, like a drowned rat uh, uh, as 2020 hits. Or here's another one, uh, more personal. You know, my plans, you know, new, mi <laughs> new ministry centre opening up, you know, the crowds flocking. And it's not just about, it, it's about wanting to see the region reached for Jesus, uh, but as 2020 has played out, I've, most of the year I've spent preaching to empty chairs uh, out there. Uh, and, uh, so, and even today you go, oh, wow, it's great that a, a bunch has gathered, but doesn't it feel like a bit of a remnant? Uh, where, where many are not here. Now, I know many of you are there watching uh, live with us, so good on you. Continue to do that. Uh, and uh, we hope you're blessed. But gee, it's not the same as seeing you face to face. <clears throat> so uh, really looking forward to catching up again soon uh, and to filling this space, but also to continuing to reach out uh, to our region. Now, in Romans chapters 9 to 11, Paul expresses these same feelings, uh, that things hadn't turned out as he or many of his fellow Jews had planned. So, you know, you look at the Old Testament and you hear God's promises to Abraham uh, and that Abraham's descendants would be blessed, 
the whole world would be blessed through Abraham. Uh, and when the Messiah came, there was an expectation that Israel would rule the world and all nations would flock to them. Um, but the way it turned out uh, is that when the, when the Messiah turned up, most of Israel reject him. They even crucify him. Then even after he's raised from the dead, most of them refuse to consider the claims of Jesus and continue on stubbornly rejecting their own long-awaited Messiah. It's, it's just not playing out as people expected. And in chapter 9, so Paul's been wrestling with these issues. In chapter 9, he showed that it's never been about just being a biological descendant of Abraham. You know, even from Abraham's children, Ishmael and Isaac, God chooses Isaac to be the recipient of the blessing. Uh, it's always been about grace, not race. Uh, that was the principle in chapter 9. Then in chapter 10, we saw that the Jews rejected God's gift of righteousness. So God had offered righteousness through Jesus and his perfect fulfilment of the law. But the Jews, in their pride, said, no, we, we want to be right with God according to obedience to the law. And not only did they fail to obey the law, but they also rejected the Messiah, through whom is forgiveness uh, and hope. Uh, and so while many of the Jews are rejecting the Messiah... Uh, the Gentiles come and do a Bradbury. You know, they, they, no one expected them to be saved, but they're putting their trust in the Messiah. They're receiving forgiveness. They're being adopted into God's family. They're part of the people of God. Um, and so where Paul gets to in chapter 11 is it's kind of like that all makes sense. It all makes sense, but it doesn't stop Paul feeling a sense of grief and heartache. Uh, a sense of longing that more of his fellow Jews could find salvation in Jesus. And so in, verse, in chapter 11, verse 1, Paul asks the question, did God reject his people? And his answer is, by no means. Did God reject Israel, the nation? By no means. Uh, and in the first few verses here, he, he, he gives a few answers to that. God has saved a remnant. Firstly, Paul is evidence of that himself. Have a look at verse 1 again. Did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself. I'm living evidence that God has not rejected all of Israel. Um, I'm a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. So while so many Jews had rejected, Paul had embraced Jesus as Messiah. He'd been saved. And he was now carrying out the very task that Israel had been given by God. Israel's job was to be a light to the nations. Uh, but if they reject the Messiah, how can they be a light to the nations? Uh, but what's going on is Paul himself is being a light to the nations. So there's point one. The second point is, in the past, when you look back before the coming of Jesus, God had always preserved a remnant. Uh, and he gives the example from Elijah's day. Uh, so you might remember Elijah. He was the prophet who felt like he was a lone, uh, a lone campaigner. Uh, you had all the prophets of Baal uh, aligned to the king of Israel at the time. And then there was Elijah the sole campaigner for the true God. And they go up the top of Mount Carmel uh, and Elijah invites them to a showdown. And all the prophets of Baal are crying out to Baal, you know, bring fire down, light the altar. But Elijah prays a simple prayer on his own without any of the fanfare and God answers his prayer. He humbles the prophets of Baal, but that doesn't stop um, Elijah being persecuted. It doesn't stop Elijah feeling like I'm the only one. I'm the only faithful Israelite left. And he gets to a point where he, he's feeling like, what's the point in carrying on? 
He actually says to God, um, I think this is 1 Kings 18, somewhere around there. He says to God, take my life. Lord, I'm the only one left. Everyone else has gone after Baal. I'm the only one left. And at this point, God gives him a reality check. Uh, and it's quoted in Romans uh, chapter 11, verse 4. God basically says, no, you're not. It might feel like you're the only one left, but I have reserved for, my, for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So whilst it might look depressing, Elijah, it's nowhere near as bad as it feels. Uh, and so press on. And that's what Elijah needs to do. And Paul says that pattern that Elijah experienced, that's what's going on today as well. Verse 5, so too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Uh, God continues to draw Jewish people to himself, even in the days of Paul, but they would come not because of race, not because they were born Jewish, but by grace. As they hear the message of Jesus, put their trust in him, so they are, em uh, are embraced, they're saved, they're, uh, they continue to be part of the people of God. And Paul says in verse 6, if it's by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Now here at the Lakes, you look at the Lakes Church, uh, it doesn't feel a very Jewish church, does it? Um, and I don't know, you might be able to help me later, but I could, I could only count two people in our church who are Jewish. Uh, so they're, they're people who are Jewish, have become Christians, uh, which is terrific. Um, but it's not many. Although when you look at the whole Central Coast, I looked at the census data, there are less than 100 Jews on the whole Central Coast. Uh, so if that's true, then we are actually got 2% of the Jews on the Central Coast here in church with us. Uh, and you go, well, how many of the other churches got? Anyway, so the point is, uh, you go, oh, okay. And if that's going on all over the world, then there may be a, actually far more Jewish Christians out there than we realise. Um, I, I don't know. Um, but the important thing is they're saved, not because they're Jewish, but because they've come to believe Jesus is the Messiah and they've come to put their faith in him, that they're justified not by works, but by what Jesus has done, acknowledging him. Um, so God is preserving a remnant, and yet the sad reality is the rest have been hardened. Verse 8, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, ears that could not hear, right down to this very day. Now, how are we meant to think about this remnant, uh, this, this portion of God's people Israel that are being saved? Now, Paul's feelings are mixed. On the one hand, there is comfort, there is encouragement. Some of my fellow Jews are being saved. But on the other hand, I hope you've felt in these chapters Paul's deep sense of longing his deep sense of grief that because he wants more to be saved. Uh, he wants them all to be saved. And so there's this real sense of comfort on the one hand. God will do his work amongst Israel. He will save some. But on the other hand, oh, I'd love more to be saved. Um, I don't know if you remember um, the ad, there was an ad on TV a couple of years ago. It was actually quite a moving ad. And um, it had this guy in an alleyway uh, being interviewed by the, by, you know, the camera. Uh, and you know, the interviewer said, in 2018, 349 people died on New South Wales roads. What do you think would be a more acceptable number? Uh, and the guy goes, oh, I don't know, you know, possibly 70. You know, he's thinking, gee, that'd be a big reduction uh, in the number who died on New South Wales roads. And then, and then at that point, this, this bunch of 70 people sort of stream into the alleyway, kind of fill the alleyway. And he goes, they're my family. Uh, and he recognises them and, and a tear comes to his eye because it's like, these are not just 70 kind of 
people, they're, they're, my, they're 70 of my people. Uh, and then the, chem, the, the interviewer says, okay, so what would be an acceptable number uh, of deaths on New South Wales Road? And he says, well, possibly zero, probably zero. Uh, and that was the whole campaign towards zero. And you kind of feel that same thing uh, with our governments at the moment. I know it's very complex issues, aren't there? Like there's um, the issues of the economy. We've got to get the economy moving. Um, all that, there's complex stuff. But at the end of the day, how many people do we want to die from coronavirus? We know that it will take some people's lives. Um, that's inevitable and it has been happening but how many do we want to die? And at, and at the end of the day, we go, well, we want it to be as close to zero as possible. And that's how Paul feels about the remnant. So on the one hand, it's comforting to know that as depressing as it looks, God is saving people. God is saving Jewish people to himself. But on the other hand, there is that deep sense of longing that more, even more, would come in. And I reckon we need to capture a sense of Paul's heart for our own community here on the Central Coast. As you look out, as you think about the suburb in which you live, um, sometimes there's great encouragements, aren't there? So last year when we had our baptism, it feels like a long time ago, you know, but we had a baptism down at Tawoon Bay, and there was 29 people baptised, and there was a crowd, or, you know, over, the, over last year, 29 people baptised, there was hundreds of us there, and it was just like this awesome moment, encouraged, you know, you feel like, oh, there's new life, people coming into the kingdom. But on the other hand, there are thousands in our suburbs, tens of thousands, who either they don't know about the Lord Jesus they're still living in ignorance of him, or there are tens of thousands who have heard the message but are refusing to believe. And that ought to grieve us. Uh, we ought to have a longing that far, far more will be saved. And I hope you can see that that's Paul's struggle as he thinks about his own people, the Jewish nation. What would be a good number to be saved? Sometimes we talk about 10% of the Central Coast, don't we? 10%. And that'd be a good number, wouldn't it? But you go, why not 100? You know, like, surely, surely our hearts should long for all to be saved. So come back to Romans 10. Because God's plans for Israel don't end with their rejection of the good news. Verse 11. Paul says, again, I asked, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery, not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, how much, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? So can you see God's plan mapped out in these verses? Firstly, Israel reject Jesus, uh, and that had been happening from the time Jesus landed, you know, throughout his ministry. As a result of that, salvation comes to the nations, and you remember the Great Commission, go to all nations, uh, baptising them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. So it's like the blessings of Israel overflow now to the nations, and many are saved, but God's plan doesn't end there. The idea is that then Israel will be provoked to jealousy, feeling like we're missing out on the blessings of our own Messiah. We're missing out on forgiveness and the Holy Spirit and the new age and the kingdom. And God's plan is that as Israel becomes jealous, so they will turn, embrace Jesus as Messiah, and they too will be saved. So all Israel are saved. Uh, and throughout the Old Testament, God had set his affection on the nation. Um, they'd taken his affection for granted. They turned aside. They reject the Messiah. And, and that's been the pattern. But 
God's plan all along is that even as the nations are, are being saved, it will provoke Israel to jealousy and stir them to put their trust in him. <clears throat> um, and, and Paul, Paul understands this plan, this map. Um, and so look at what he says in verse 13. <clears throat> he says, I'm talking to you Gentiles Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, so Paul was Jewish, but Jesus had sent him deliberately to the nations, to the Gentiles. Uh, Inasmuch as I'm apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. Uh, So Paul, as a Jewish apostle to the nations, he, go, he makes a lot of his ministry so that his fellow Jews go, oh, the Gentiles are being saved. Where does that leave us? Um, I've got a friend um, called Martin Pakula, and I know some of you here know Martin. Um, brilliant guy. Uh, in, a, in a number of subjects, he topped the HSC. He topped the state in the HSC, like just an incredible mind. Uh, Midway through his training to be a doctor, he became a Christian and that kind of diverted his whole life path and uh, he left medicine to become a pastor. So he did sort of MTF ministry training uh, uh, at the same time as me at New South Wales Uni. We headed off to Bible college, became a Jewish Christian pastor. Um, And while Ruth and I were in Newtown, we met uh, a lovely young Jewish lady and we shared the message of Jesus with her. Um, and we took her along to uh, an event that Martin was hosting. So at, at, during the Jewish festivals like the Passover and Yom Kippur and so on, during those festivals, um, Martin would have an outreach meeting where people could invite Jewish friends to hear uh, to be reminded of the Jewish festival, but to show how it's fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. And this is what Martin said at the end of his talk. He said, millions of Gentiles have put their trust in our Messiah because he's the Jewish Messiah. And millions of Gentiles have put their trust in him. Millions of Gentiles are reading our scriptures. They're being saved and forgiven and blessed by our God. Doesn't that make you envious? And what Martin was doing with his ministry, seeking to reach the Jews in Sydney, was he was making much of what was going on amongst Gentiles in the hope that Jews would go, yes, these, this is our God. These are the promises that we should have embraced. This is our Messiah, Jesus. Um, and the goal was that they might turn and be saved. Now, as Paul unpacks these big grand plan of God, he shows three ways or three responses that it should kind of bring about in us. And the first response for us who predominantly are Gentile Christians, that is, we're not Jewish in origin, uh, the first response is humility. One of the dangers, and you've seen it happen throughout history, is that sometimes Gentile Christians can start feeling like we're somehow better than Jewish non-Christians, that somehow a racism or an arrogance can come about. And Paul uses the metaphor of an olive tree to keep us humble. And so I've brought my own olive tree along. How good is this? Um, Direct from home, it really is uh, olive, right? Um, it's not actually a tree. I cut a branch off my olive tree. But, I, but anyway, look, just run with me here. All right, so, and here it is. Uh, and so the idea is um, you've got this uh, olive tree. Um, it's, it's, it's pictorial, right? Because the olive tree would be much more substantial than this. Uh, but what it is, it's got this kind of, this trunk, then deep roots into the soil. And I take it the roots are probably talking about the promises made by God to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the covenant with David, uh, the promises of the prophets. There's deep roots that should produce faith uh, amongst God's people and sustain them 
uh, with salvation and forgiveness and so on. Uh, uh, and and out, of, out of the tree, you know, comes Jesus uh, and, you know, and he is... Uh, I, I, you know, well, anyway, let's not run with the metaphor too much. But, but basically, Jesus is, is, you know, if anything, the trunk of this tree. You know, it's, it's by becoming, uh, becoming united to him that we become part of the people of God. But anyway, so here's the olive tree, deep roots in the promises of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Um, and what's happened is some of the, some of the branches are being, have been pruned off. So those ones clearly dead uh, dead wood, but but the idea is that some Jews, through unbelief, have been removed from the people of God, um, uh, and then what God has done. Now this is these are, this is not actually um, olive. This is I don't even know what this is. Someone might be able to tell me later. I just found some random tree uh, growing out in the bush back of our house. Right. So um, and what God has done. Just imagine that this is a wild, a wild olive tree, uh, and what God has done is what you can do is you can sort of, you can just do a cut, and then see what I've done there, grafted it into the tree. I'll do it a little bit more. Uh, here's another bit, uh, and so here's another Gentile who, like they're not a child of Abraham by biology. But as they come to put their trust in Jesus as Messiah, so they too, just cut it in there. This is, this is, like, this is gardening 101, you know, like um, they too can be grafted in to the olive tree. Um, and the way grafting works is that if it's done well, uh, then, then the, the branch that's been connected to the trunk actually then draws the nutrients and the goodness and so on and becomes integrally part of the plant. Uh, and that's what, that's what Paul's saying. Look, um, you Gentiles, you don't belong on the tree by nature, but by God's grace and mercy, you've been grafted in and you draw those beautiful nutrients of the blessings of the Messiah and so on. Uh, but verse 17, um, if some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in, verse 18, don't consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. Be careful. Before we become arrogant, we need to hear this. Verse 19, you will say, well, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in, well, granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Don't be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. So the, the, whole, the whole way that we've been included into the people of God is by grace. But if we become proud and arrogant and somehow think, I, I deserve to be here. Uh, if we start, start to think, I'm here because of my goodness, and I, you look at other people compared, what, 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 what Paul is saying is you could be removed. Now, it'll be a harsher removal than that, a, pr a pruning, uh, but you could just as easily be removed. And there's no, there's no problem with God taking one of the olive branches that were native branches, one of the Jewish people who have rejected the Messiah, as they put their trust in Jesus, there's no harm, there's no reason that God cannot graft them into the olive tree as well. Um, that's in verse 23. Um, so there's no room for pride for us, no room for arrogance, no room for taking all this for granted. It's only by the mercy and grace of God that we Gentiles have come in. No room for racism or anti-Semitic attitudes. But the second response, he says, is it's a response of hope. Verse 24, if you were cut off, sorry, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature, you were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So can you see that 
The olive tree and the grafting thing not only brings life for the Gentiles, but it's also, it's also hope for Jews who have formally rejected Jesus that if they turn around, if they put their faith in the Lord Jesus, they too can be grafted back into the tree. Um, verse 25, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Can you see Paul has this hope? All Israel will be saved. Now, what, is, what does Paul mean by all Israel. We know from chapter 9, verse 6, if you go back to where the, this discussion started, in chapter 9, verse 6, we know that God has never promised that every biological descendant of Abraham will be saved. Um, it's always been about grace, not race. Um, so all Israel doesn't mean every single person of Jewish origin. But Paul does have an expectation that more and more Jews will come to embrace Jesus as Messiah. And for many it will be as they see the blessings of the Messiah being received by the Gentiles and they are stirred to say, I want some of that. I want to be part of that. Now, how is this going to happen? There are two main options as far as I can see. The first option is bit by bit, almost imperceptibly. Um, like in the days of Elijah. Uh, you know, remember how God was working behind the scenes so that Elijah, even the prophet of God, hadn't realised the incredible work God was doing behind the scenes, bringing 7,000 to himself. God so often works like that. Remember Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed uh, and it's planted and then imperceptibly grows and before you know it, you go out and have a look and there's this massive big tree and all the birds are coming to find shelter in it. And you think, wow. But the whole point of that is it's something really small and then imperceptibly, bit by bit, it grows into something huge. Um, we used to sing a, so a song and it had this line in it. Soul by soul and silently, her citizens increase. Uh, and it's just this feeling that Bit by bit, God gathers people into his kingdom. Uh, and just, just the ones and twos over months and years and so on adds up to a great big work of God. Uh, that's so often the character of God's kingdom. And that could be what Paul has in mind, that bit by bit, almost imperceptibly, all Israel will be saved. Or it could be talking about an end time revival. Um, and throughout you know, the history of Christianity, there have been times of incredible revival. Um, so if you look back to uh, the 18th century or the 18th century, like Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards and so on, experienced incredible revival through England, uh, through America. They, the Americans still talk about it as the great awakening, the great spiritual awakening where so many were impacted and converted. Uh, or even just 50 years ago, some of you will have experienced the Billy Graham Crusades. I wasn't there. But, you know, during those days, what was it, 59? 59, 69? Uh, you were there 59, brother. Okay, a toddler, a little baby coming in uh, uh, in the bassinet. Uh, now, so, but apparently the whole of Sydney was well aware that this was going on. The whole of Sydney was talking about this. And tens of thousands of people over those nights went down, gave their life to Jesus. Uh, and many of you today, you know, many of you here today are a legacy of that time of revival uh, in the city of Sydney. Now, wouldn't it be fantastic if God did that again in our time? Uh, I would love to see the whole central coast unable to kind of 
ignore the claims of Jesus. This is, this is what our vision statement is, isn't it? We want God's word and Jesus' love to so fill us and overflow from us that everyone in our region has compelling reason to follow Jesus. Um, and, you know, God can do that through a trickle, bit by bit, imperceptibly over time, or God can do it in a flood, you know, a, a time of incredible revival. Um, and, and, and I guess as I think about what Paul's saying here, either way, which, whichever, however it's going to play out, Paul is confident that God will gather many Jews to himself. And Romans leaves you in no doubt the only way they will be saved is not because they're Jewish. It's because they put their trust in Jesus, the Messiah. I'll tell you about my friend Martin again, uh, you know, the Jewish Christian pastor. When he started a Jewish Christian church in Sydney, right, right at Town Hall in Sydney, um, he was very active in preaching the gospel to Jews. Um, and it became something that the Jewish um, rabbis in Sydney became aware of and became unsettled by because they were feeling like, we don't want to, you know, all the Jews taken out of our synagogues off to Martin's church. And so they wrote to the Anglican Archbishop to command him to stop preaching the message of Jesus to Jewish people. Um, and because Martin was, um, you know, an Anglican minister at the time, uh, they accused Martin of being anti-Semitic, which was a big call because Martin himself was Jewish and the whole drive of his ministry was because of his love for his fellow Jews. Uh, he himself was a Jew who had come to know Jesus and he wanted his other fellow Jews to know the same life-giving message. And it's the same pattern with Paul. You know, Paul, I reckon some of the Jews in his day could have called him anti-Semitic, you know, anti-Jewish, because so many people were leaving the synagogues and coming to put their faith in Jesus as Messiah. Um, and I just want to say, preaching the gospel to Jews is not anti-Semitic. Uh, it is the loving thing to do. And it's the same in our community. Um, most people out there on the Central Coast don't actually want to hear the message of Jesus. Let's not kid ourselves. They're not sitting there thinking, gee, I wish someone would knock on my door right now and do, a, do one of those conversations on the doorstep to share the good news of Jesus. They're not kind of hanging out for it. Um, and yet the most loving thing we can do is take the gospel to our streets and suburbs, our workplaces, our neighbours. Uh, and like some, even many, will be resistant. But those that receive the good news will be saved and they will look back and say, praise God that my friend had the courage and the love to bring the message of Jesus to me. Because I didn't really want to hear it, although now I realise it's exactly what I needed to hear. All right, so God's plan produces humility, hope, and thirdly, praise. I want you to listen to how Paul finishes the section. He says, oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I started um, talking about you know, the plans we make and the reality uh, as things turn out. And there's often a big difference between my plan and the reality. And 2020, my plan's reality. You know, it's, it, there's a big gap between the two. But God's plans are bigger, so much bigger than ours. They're so much wiser. They're, they're perplexing at times, aren't they? Because you think, wow, 
That's a, that's a, for God to harden his people only to arouse them to jealousy and save them, that's a, that's a strange plan, isn't it? But what it does mean is that at the end of the day, the only way anyone will stand amongst the people of God, you know, into eternity, we will only be there because of God's mercy. None of us will be able to say, well, I'm better than you because you only snuck in by the mercy of God, but I kind of have earned my right to be here. No, on that last day, all of us will share this humility of there but for the grace of God. Uh, I'm only here because of the mercy of God shown to me in Jesus. God's plans are deeper, higher, bigger, wiser than anything that we could imagine or comprehend. So I'm going to uh, lead us in praise of our great God now. Will you pray with me? God, our Father, we want to thank you for your word that brings, brings us in touch with reality. Uh, Father, sometimes we can dress our lives up as if we're better than we are, but you teach us to acknowledge our sin, uh, to acknowledge the way we resist you, the way we disobey you. We are sorry for those things. And we are so thankful for your mercy that you have shown us through Jesus, that you don't make us pay for what we've done into eternity because Jesus has paid it all. And so, Father, we come to you humbly, recognising that if not for the grace that you have shown us in Jesus, we would be lost. But through Jesus, we are saved. Please make us humble. Please make us humble as we think about the people in our region or as we think about the many Jewish people in our world who are resisting the claims of Jesus. Father, please help us not to be racist or arrogant in any way, uh, but deeply humble. And Father, help us to be filled with hope, not despair. As we look around, we, it, it does feel like, oh, we just love so many more people to know of your love and your salvation. Help us not to despair, but to live in hope, to trust the message of Jesus, that it is your means of bringing salvation. And help us to persevere in it. Uh, help our church to persevere in sharing this good news uh, with the people of our region. And Father, we pray that you'll press on us uh, that it's not about us at the end of the day. It's all about you and your son. We pray that our lives will be lived to your praise, your glory, and your honour. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, David. You're probably wondering where... Jenny is gone, the lady with the lovely voice. Unfortunately, because of the COVID, we're only allowed one singer. So she has graciously said, uh, David, would you like to sing? So here I am. I'm really sorry that you can't sing. Uh, it's like you're bound and gagged. It's, it's a terrible thing. But for those of you who are home, you can make up for it. You can sing as loud as you can so that the neighbours can hear you. And you guys here in the Ministry Centre, um, you're welcome to stay seated or stand, close your eyes or whatever you want to do. This uh, last song is called Yet Not I But Christ In Me. And uh, the first song we sang was all about Jesus. The second song we sang was about the crucifixion and the blood running, running free for us. And this song has got so many beautiful Christian truths that we hold close to us and I'm sure that even though you can't sing that you'll really sing in your heart to God to Jesus to thank him for these beautiful truths
What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is fully crowned to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side, my Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. All the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future show, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. All the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring me home. And day by day, I know that He will know me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for the glory evermore to be. When the race is complete, still my lips Still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Folks, what a great service that we've had this morning. We've been encouraged again through God's word. And what a great message, humility, Hope and praise. I mean, man, that's 
who God wants us to be, and that's who our neighbours are looking for as well, aren't they? Humility, some hope, and some praise in their hearts. Just before we leave, I do need a couple of people just to volunteer to wipe down the backs of the chairs here for COVID. I see that hand and I just need one more. Great. And if you could see Tim. And folks, we do need to leave the auditorium so they can do that. We do need to pick up our teens and we do need to exit sight uh, after you say good day to each other um, so that the next service can come in. Have a great day, folks. Thank you.